We're gonna talk about Balaam. You know, in the sense of him portraying the false messiah. And this isn't going to be an exhaustive study. But we're going to take a look into it enough to see, you know, the parallels of, of how he aligned with, with our Messiah. You know, as well as, you know, what we can deduce from his story in conjunction with Messiah to see how this Yah's overall plan ultimately will play out. You know, because they're, they're still... A Balaam coming. There's still a false messiah coming. And, and, you know, if we're not careful, we're not going to recognize him from the true messiah. And many people will be fooled. And it's easy to sit here today and say, well, you, psh, of course I will know. You know, <laughs> I know that's not the messiah. But, you know, nah, it's not going to be that easy. You know, and that's the thing that, that, that a lot of you know, saints, <clears throat> and I use that term loosely, you know, that's that's the, the thing that a lot of saints think that they, they would definitely know, you know, that they know the Messiah, you know, well enough to know when someone's faking them. You know, even though the word says that even Yah's very elect would be fooled mm -hmm. if it were possible. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's an admonition. So that being said, let's take a look at just some of the parallels uh, with Balaam and Yahushua. You know, first we see <coughs> Balaam, whose name means not of the people. And Yahushua was not of this world. Now, just in, in looking at his name and knowing that it means not of the people, you can see one... You can see the the prophetic or <coughs> symbolic picture of one being not of the people, you know, uh, i.e. Kodesh, you know, in a type of type of way, uh, not Kodesh but maybe Kadesh, you know, as in <coughs> Kadesh Barnea, that quasi holiness, that 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 place that looks like holiness and acts like holiness but just not holy. <laughs> yeah, that place. Uh, <laughs> You know, so we can see that even even in, in his name, you know, and whereas we're called to not be of the world, you know, i.e. not be of the people, so is Balaam not of the people. So he, he will look like he's holy. We see that Balaam, he rises in the morning, and Yahushua is the morning star. And we know that trouble endures for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. We know he, he'll be returning in the morning. Balaam, his father is Beor, which means burning. <laughs> Yahushua's father is Elohim, who, who is a consuming fire. <laughs> now, Balaam is from the land of the Seder. That's what... Uh, his, his home homeland translates to Yahushua is from Bethlehem, the house of bread, mm -hmm. which speaks of the teachings and instructions of mm -hmm. Elohim. And just as Balaam was famous in his land for being the sayer or prophet of, of that land, mm -hmm. so is Messiah famous for being the prophet from Bethlehem house of bread. We have Balaam, who was a prophet of Elohim. Yahushua was a prophet of Elohim. It is said that whom Balaam blessed was blessed, and whom he cursed was cursed. Well, the same is said of Yahushua. Whom he blesses is blessed, and whom he curses is cursed. Balaam said he'd only do Yah's word. <laughs> Yahushua only did Yah's word. Now, even though Balaam said he'd only do Yah's word, he done some other things outside of Yah's word. <laughs> and 
Yahushua, he said he only did Yah's word, and that's all he did. Now, Balaam, uh, Yah shouldn't be in front of that, but Balaam was sent to curse Israel. And Yahushua was sent to bless Israel. But even though Balaam was sent to curse Israel, he ended up blessing Israel. <laughs> and even though Yahushua was sent to bless Israel, he ended up cursing part of Israel. Balaam was tempted three times of the destroyer of Balak. Balak names means desolation or destruction. Yahushua was tempted three times a of time, the adversary. Balaam rode upon a rebellious ass. <laughs> Yahushua, in a sense, rode upon a rebellious ass. But in addition to riding upon it, he also rode upon an obedient. Mm -hmm. Balaam was tempted three times of his ass, which depicts the priest. Yahushua was tempted three times of the priest. Balaam spoke in parables. Yahushua spoke in parables. Balaam became a stumbling block to Israel. Yahushua became a stumbling block to Israel in these parts. You know, so we see, and these, this isn't even an exhaustive <coughs> parallel of, of the likenesses of Balaam and Yahushua. You know, there, there, there's more that can be added unto this, I'm sure. You know, but even though both of these stories transpired in the past, they still have a prophetic nature in that they speak to when Balaam would join with Bal Balak. That is, when the false prophet would join with the destroyer. Anyone know who uh, the destroyer is? Abaddon. Yeah, Apollyon or Abaddon in, in the Greek, you know. His name means the destroyer. And he's the one that, uh, that will often be called the abomination of desolation. You know, it's, uh, he, he brings about the desolations or the destruction. And during the same time, Yah will send his two servants to retrieve his priesthood. You know, so... Uh, even when we see Yahushua coming into town on, on, on the ass and the coat, that even has, it has a prophetic aspect as, as well as uh, uh, the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to pick up our story in Numbers 22, uh, beginning with, Numbers 22, verses 21 and 22, it reads, it says, And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab, which Moab means of his father. And Elohim's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of Yahuwah stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. Now, I just want us to take note that Moab means of his father. And uh, in Yochanan 844, the Messiah is speaking to the Pharisees, um, speaking to them of um, who were of their father. And he says, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there was no truth in him. He speaketh a lie, and he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar. And the father of it. You know, so 
this is uh, Moab, in, in a sense, could be likened to those who were of their father that the Messiah was speaking, speaking of, um, the sons of the wicked one, who was of their father, the devil. Mm -hmm. Now, we're picking up the story from the point where Balaam has saddled his, his, uh, his ass and determined to go and hook up with Balaam. So, this is, this is we're picking it up from when he's, he's determined that he's going to go and hook up with the destroyer. You know, uh, futuristically speaking of when Apollyon is, is up on the earth and here it is, the false prophet goes and hook up with him. Now, let us also take note of that this is this is when Yahushua would also send for for his priesthood, i.e., his ass. I feel so awkward using that word. We're gonna have to switch that to donkey or something. Yeah. Just feel just feel funny. Uh, Mark 11, 1 through 3, my first reader, please. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem and to Bethage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent forth two of his disciples and said unto them, Go your way into the village over against you. And as soon as ye be entered into it, he shall find a cold tie, here or never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Adonai had needed of him, and straightway he will send him hither. Okay. Uh, let's see what we can glean from here. Uh, first of all, we have. When they came nigh unto Jerusalem, unto Bethphage and Bethany and Mount of Olives, we're going to get into that a little later. And he sent forth two disciples. We see here in Numbers 22 that there were also two servants with Balaam. And when he was, when he was, uh, when he had his his donkey. And here it is. We we see it says. Balaam rose up in the morning. We know the Messiah comes comes back in, in the morning. So this is around the morning time, you know, prophetically speaking, about the time that the Messiah is gonna gonna come back. And he sends his, these two his two servants out to go and retrieve his donkey, which which uh, speaks to his priesthood. And it said unto him, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered, ye shall find a coat wherein never man sat. Loose him and bring him. Okay? Now, Matthew speaks to the donkey and the coat. But Mark and Luke only speaks to, well, Matthew and John both speak of the donkey and the coat. And Mark and Luke, they only speak to the coat. So there's like a little extra emphasis on the coat. And the coat was a baby donkey that had never been ridden before. And it spoke, it actually speaks to the priesthood of Melchizedek. You know, the priesthood of Melchizedek, you know, never had to carry, carried, uh, they wasn't, they wasn't yoked per se. They didn't have to carry that burden as, as was commanded um, to the Aaronic priesthood. All right, let's uh, take a look at this prophetically. Let me have my next reader read Revelations 13, 11 through 18, and we're, we're going to liken this into Numbers 22, 21, and 22, Balaam rising in the morning and and saddling his his uh, donkey and hooking up with with uh, the the one that's of his father, Moab. This speaks to uh, a bad. 
And I behold, another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he make a fire come down from heaven on the earth of the sun of the sign of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by, wound by a sword and did live and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed and cause all both small and great rich and poor free and bound to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save save he that that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of the name here is wisdom let him that have understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Okay. Now, there's a whole lot that we can we can uh, glean from this. Uh, first of all, in verse eleven, we you know uh, the first part of uh, Revelation chapter three it speaks to the first beast, which is Apollyon, you know, and here it is, the second, the second um, um, beast here speaks to the false prophet, uh, the false prophet, Antichrist, false messiah, whatever you choose to call him. And take note that he had two horns like a lamb. So he, here it is, he's going he's gonna to look like a lamb. But he spake as a dragon. You know, it's kind of hard not to do that because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So even though he's going to put on a good show, all we have to do is listen to what comes out of his mouth. Listen to his words. And if we know the words of Elohim, then we'll be able to, to tell who he is. Now, the problem is that even, to, even though those of us who know the word, we're not going to trust it. That's going to be the problem. Yeah. It's not that we're not going to recognize mm -hmm. that what he's saying is contrary to the word. Mm -hmm. He's going to be twisting it and trying to make it make make one think that it's to be understood in another manner. Mm -hmm. And that's where people are going to get caught up because he's not just going to be saying this, but he's going to be doing it in conjunction with what we see in verse 13 of 13, great wonders, so that he make a fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of God. You know, now that's that's a real that's that's a real, 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 real big um sign of wonder right there, scripturally speaking. Because before Yahshua comes, we know the spirit of who comes. Elijah, Eliyahu. Now, Eliyahu whole ministry was about showing that Yahuwah was there. Right? Mm -hmm. yes. And the way that he done that, that's what set this precedence throughout scripture where folks of scripture, you know, undoubtedly knew who was of Elohim if they could make Fire come from heaven because that was the test. Yes. Yes. You know, you you set up your altar and you offer a sacrifice. I'm gonna set up my altar unto Yah and I'm gonna offer a sacrifice. And whoever L is the true L, if Yahoo will be the true L, then he'll consume my sacrifice. And if your L be true, then he'll he'll consume your sacrifice. And of course, the prophets of Baal they couldn't. Their L wouldn't. And couldn't 
consume their sacrifice, and, and Elijah was clowning them. Yeah. Eliyahu was clowning them, you know, where he at? He on vacation? He's sleeping? Right, he was trash talking real strong, you know. He taking a nap? <laughs> what's, what's happening? You know, but then it comes to Eliyahu, and he calls on Yah, and Yah, man, Yah, he didn't just consume the sacrifice. He done it in grand fashion. You know, Eli, Eliyahu had him put the sacrifice, dig a trench around it, fill it with water, you know, the whole now. He come bring fire down, lick up all the water and everything. And then burn up the sacrifice. And then consume the sacrifice. I mean, just in grand fashion, you know, in Yah style, you know. And so, you know, ever since then, Whenever, you know, they seen that sign, mm -hmm. you know, it spoke, it spoke to the people of the word. It spoke to them that that was of Elohim. Right. But here it is. We see here, we're forewarned mm -hmm. that he will even be able to do that. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it goes on in verse 14 and saying, Deceive of them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Mm -hmm. Now, another, something else, though, that we don't want to skip over is verse 12. It says, he exercised with all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast mm -hmm. whose deadly wound was healed. Okay, so here it is. We're speaking of someone who had died and was somehow resurrected mm -hmm. some type of way. Because if you had a deadly wound, that means that's a wound that caused you to die. Caused you to be dead, I mean. Mm -hmm. Now, it was healed. So that means somehow that which was dead is now alive. And here it is. This uh, false messiah, he's going to have something to do with this. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. And the first beast, beast before him, upon you he's going to be ruling and reigning. So here it is, we see him ruling and reigning, you know, in some type of manner. He's exercising that power. And it says, he goes on to do these great wonders, deceives the earth, and, and uh, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now that's a big hint right there. He had a wound. By sword. Hmm. You know, and we know the sword speaks to what? The word, the word of Elohim. And who's who yields that who yields that word? The saints. You know, not only the saints, but those uh two those those two servants that's gonna be sent to bring the priesthood on, over to Yah. Hmm. They too are gonna have a sword. They're going to have the word of Elohim. And they're going to be using it too. In grand fashion. You know. So much so. That these two are going to join forces. And here it is. My man going to be resurrected some type of way. Just the mere fact of him coming back on the scene. Coming back on the earth. In, in one sense. Is a type of resurrection. Because. He's he's in prison in the bottomless pit. And before we, we, we see this, we see Satan uh, coming down with the keys to uh to the keys and letting them out. You know, and it speaks of one who was and yet is. You know another play on words because we know the Messiah is he who was and is and is to come. But he just, he who was and yet is. Because <laughs> after he is, he ain't coming back no more. <laughs> he was and he gonna be is and he gonna be is gone. You know, so <laughs> we won't have to worry about him anymore after this spell. But he's gonna, he's gonna do quite a whammy while, while he is again. You know, but check this out. We see that the false, the false prophet, the false messiah, antichrist, whatever you want to call him, he's saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. And 
in verse 18, we, we hear it speaks of wisdom and saying, you know, count the number of the beast. Of course, the number of a man and his number six score, three score, and six. But we have to understand that there's three aspects to this beast and there's three aspects to this number. You know, there's the beast, the image of the beast, and the number of the beast. And we see here in verse 14, you know, the false prophet is, is encouraging the people of the earth to make this image. And when they make this image, it says that he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Mm -hmm. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now that's pretty big right there. Here it is, we're talking about who made the, who made the image. Man made the image. Because he deceived them that dwell on the earth. And he said to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. Yeah. So they made, man made the image. But then he gave power to it. He gave power to the image that it might live. That it should speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now... What that sound like to me in archaic terms that can speak to something that that could really uh, take place today, that sounds to me like some type of computer or robot. You know, some type of computerized uh, robot. Robot being the image. Computer being the brain so to speak, that allows it to speak and, and causes many not to worship the image. You know, so, you know, I see technology in that. You know, instead of, uh, you know, some hocus pocus, you know, I see technology in that. And in real talk, they have the technology today to do this. They have the technology today to do it. And it but it sounds like it's going to be perfected by this false messiah. Because it says he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast. And cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, this is not etched in stone. I'm not saying that that's what this is. I don't want nobody leaving here and saying, well, that's the other guy said. No. But that's what I see in this, you know, the possibility. You know, I see this as being one possibility of how this could play out. And it's something that can, we, we see it's something that can keep an account of whomever is and whomever isn't worshiping it. You see that? Because... In order for it to know, the cause as many that would not worship the image of the beast to be killed, they had to know who was worshiping it and who wasn't. Mm -hmm. And it says, you know, one of the ways that it's going to keep up with them is in verse 16. It says, he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, this could be very easily done, you know, uh, this could be done with a debit card. In all actuality, I hear everybody say, you know, well, they might put a chip in you and this, that, and the other. But in all actuality, this, this could be done with a debit card. You know, because it says in verse 17 that, that no man might buy or sell, say that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Okay, so in other words, there's something that has an image on it, or which is, speaks to the mark. It has a name on it, and it has a number on it. Right. Now, I hear everybody's talking about, you know, yeah, they're going to chip you, you know, and all this, that, and the other, but it could be a simple debit card. A debit card has an image on it. Visa, MasterCard, Discover, you know, whichever one, you know. It has... 
It has a number on it. And it has a name on it, does it not? Yes. So, now, just, just imagine, most people are right-handed, so when they go to use their credit card or debit card, you know, it's in their what? Right hand. <clears throat> now, if you're one of those cats like myself that memorize your, uh, your number, <laughs> then it's in your head. And you can still use it either way, I mean. You know, and you know, this is just some of the possibilities of how this could play out now today. You know, this could really easily be done with a world currency. And that's all I'm speaking to. Is a world a world currency. A cashless currency. That one that's that's uh, an electronic or computerized currency. This that that can make all this become a reality overnight. You know, and they're already they're already doing it. You know, the uh, the prototypes are already in existence. I don't know if any of you are familiar with like Bitcoin. You know, but that's one uh, just computer computer uh, uh, birthed currency that's like really blowing up right now. You know, you had some previous to that that was uh, based off of uh, gold and silver, you know, that uh, that did real well, but then, you know, then crashed. But Bitcoin is the first one that went up under the scrutiny of the government and still is in existence. So that's saying something big. You know, that's saying something real big. And they're not backed by by uh, gold or silver. So, you know, that's that's something, you know, something to really, really consider, you know. But that would speak to all this in a nutshell. You don't have that, that world currency, whatever it is. If it's an electronic currency, you don't have it. You don't have your card. You can't buy. You can't sell. You know, that would answer that. Today, that, that would be easily done from a, tech, uh, from a technological viewpoint. Uh, oh, just to speak to that wonder, too, that uh, making fire come down from heaven, that can be easily done today, too, from a technological viewpoint. It's called lasers. You know, from the top of, uh, what do they call them things? Satellites. You know, we're, we're said to have some type of defense system called Star Wars that can hit any target the size of a dime anywhere on the globe. So fire from heaven is that's that's not a big that's not a big problem today. You know, but when you put all these things together with people who are who are uh, ignorant to to such technology, it looks miraculous. Looks like magic. Next reader, Mark 11, 4 through 9. And they went their way and found the coat tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye loosen the coat? And they said unto them, Even as Yahushua had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the coat to Yahushua, and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees, and strawed them in the way, crying, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of Adonai. Okay. Now, we see at the same, during, at the same time, you know, Yah's sending his, his two servants, and take note, both of them use two servants. Why not three? Why not four? You know, but they both send their two servants. I mean, and they went their way and they found the coat tied by the door with, um, without in a place where two ways met, you know, and they loosed him. You know, so this coat speaks to, as we said earlier, the priesthood of Melchizedek. 
Now take note that he's tied by the door without a place where two ways met. In other words, he's tied to a fork in the road. That's where two, two places meet. Two roads meet. We're talking about a fork in the road. One way is a wide way that leadeth unto destruction that Balaam takes his road. The other way is Yahushua's way, the way of the vineyard, the path of the vineyards. And we're going to get into a little in a little bit. So here it is. He's tied to this fork in the road. But he's without a place. He's without in a place. So in all actuality, he's, he's out of He's out of the, uh, the the main place or the main city. He's without in a place where two worlds meet. So this is really a picture of the priesthood of Melchizedek in the wilderness at a fork in the road. Anyone ever felt like they were at a fork in the road? Not sure which way to go? To the left, to the right, you know. But here it is, we're going to know for surety because Yah's going to send his two servants to come and get us, to loose us from this fork in the road. And then we're going to become one way. We're going to become one way. We're only going to travel one way. We're, we're, we're going to be sure, we're going to be certain of ourselves. You know, and it, it speaks to uh, those who who uh, own the coat. Ask him, "What do ye? What you doing, loosening that coat?" Hmm. And of course, Yah had told them if, if, if they asked, and, and over in Luke it speaks of them as being their owners that was asking. And they asked, and it says, "Messiah, you know, he has need of him." Hmm. And hence we see in verse 6, and they said unto him, even as Yahushua had commanded, and they let them go. Why they let them go without a fight? Because they're already bought and paid for. The price has already been paid. You know, this is this is that same uh, typology as, as him coming to get his bride. The dowry already been paid. They already have, they had those, uh, as, uh, who is that, Sister <coughs> Sister Rebecca? They already had the bangles and stuff on their wrists. You know, they, they already done received their down payment. They have their proof of purchase. You know, so you'll get no argument because they already brought the paper, you got to let them go. I'm sending, sending for him, sending for mine. So they take him and they bring him unto Yahushua. Now this is real, this is real, uh, this is real, real sweet right here. This is real sweet right here. It says, and they, they, they brought the coat to Yahushua, so they bring him the priesthood to Yahushua and cast their garments on him. They cast their garments on the coat. Now, what does the garments typify? Again, what does the garment do? Cover. Cover. Exactly. So we're, we're looking at a covering that's put upon them. And then we're looking at Yahshua being placed atop. But check this out. Verse 8. And they spread their garments in the way. And they, and others cut down branches off trees and straw them in the way. So they're walking on a covering. And they have a covering on top of them with Yahshua on top of that. Their feet are covered and the top of them are covered. Well, the 
looking at someone that's completely covered with Yahshua atop. You know, and as far as the branches being thrown down off the trees, the branches are that which have life. So it's speaking of life. So they're, they're walking covered in life. This is a beautiful picture, prophetic picture of the saints being sealed of Elohim. As we read in Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 through 4, it says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living Elohim. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our Elohim in their foreheads. Mm -hmm. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed and hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, we see a picture of that entailed even within this story. Mm -hmm. Those who are truly covered, you know, they're walking upon a covering, and they have a covering over their back. They have Messiah atop of them or in their head. This is our seal. The Ruach HaKodesh and the Messiah. The Ruach HaKodesh, which fills us and covers us. You know, this is an awesome picture. Now, as we, as we said, the donkey speaks to the two priesthoods. In number 79, it teaches us about the duties of the Aaronic priesthood. It says, but unto the sons of Kohath, he gave none, because the service of the sanctuary belonging unto them that they should bear upon their shoulders. Now, this is a part of all the three duties of, of the um, sons of, uh, of Levi. But as we see, the Kohathites, they were to bear the burden on their shoulders. You know, and this is what the, this is what the priesthood, you know, this is what they, they were to do. And, and this is uh, what the the donkey symbolizes. It symbolizes he who bears the burden of, of Elohim. You know, we even see when David was trying to bring the tabernacle, you know, uh, bring the ark into the tabernacle that he erected. They, they didn't, they, they wouldn't put, at first they didn't put the ark on the shoulders of the Levites on the shoulders of the priests like, like Yah had, had prescribed for them to do. They had, they had it on the shoulders, uh, they had it in a new cart and on the shoulders of oxen. And Yah went to knock it off to let them know that they were out of order. And Uzzah tried to stop it, whose name means strength. He tried to, he tried to stop it, do it in his own strength, and he dropped dead. Because it's not by strength nor by might. But by his spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's you know, that's the thing here. Mm -hmm. You know, we're called to bear Yahshua upon us. Mm -hmm. And we're to have Yahshua on our backs, just like just like this uh little young coat had Yahshua on his back. And we're to carry him and we're to have we're to keep ourselves covered mm -hmm. top and bottom. Now, the donkey was a very well-respected animal in biblical times. As much as, in, as much in some cases, more than the horse. For unlike the horse, the horses, the donkey was very sure-footed. It didn't matter what kind of terrain you would go over, they could handle it. You know, up the mountain side and down the, the, uh, the, the slopes, they could handle it. Whereas the horse, you know, he had, he had much more trouble. So this allowed, you know, this, would, this made him real valuable and allowed him to travel, 
real harsh terrain that would trouble the average horse. Now the horses they had their they had their uh, their place too. You know they were instruments of war. You know because they were very brave and you know and and kind of fast and kind of unstoppable at times. You know, I mean who gonna stand in front of a Russian horse, especially when it's one the size of a Clydesdale? <laughs> you know that's like a train coming at you. You are gonna get out the way. You know. Now, additionally, these uh, these uh, donkeys they could they could stomach much coarser vegetation. You know, other harsh terrains more so than than that of their cousins, um, the horses or the camels. You know, so they were made to be out in the wilderness, which is exactly where we're supposed to be out in the wilderness. See, and we're supposed to be like those donkeys, like that donkey carrying, that young colt carrying Yahshua. You know, we're supposed to be able to, to survive out there in that wilderness on that coarse vegetation, even as Yochanan and Mercer did. You know, now that said, the camel, he could eat much more of what was offered in the wilderness than a horse could. But the problem with the camel, even though that he would suffice, he would be great actually, because you know he was stronger and could last longer than the donkey. But they wasn't used as much because they were so expensive. You know, that was like, you know, that was like the Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the Cadillac with the bins of the, of the uh, beast of burden, you know. Their pricing, they, uh, their pricing, you know, kept the laymen away from them. You know, they were kind of priced out of their market. So the only ones that you seen with, with camels were, were like royalty and, and the wealthy. They were the only ones who's, who owned camels. Now, it would have been awesome if, you know, you, you could have had some camels, you know. And, you know, but no. Yeah, he, he, he said he'd make do with the dump. He want everybody to be able to participate. Yeah. Yeah. You know. You yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Numbers 2.23 says, And the donkey saw the angel of Yahuwah standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smoked the donkey to turn her into the way. What do we have here? Hereby we learn that the donkey or the priest, even those that's, that's following after Balaam, they will one day, one day recognize, they're going to one day wake up, they're going to recognize that there's an adversary in the way that they're walking. An adversary, the scent of Yah, that's in the way that they've been traveling, attempting to turn, uh, and they're going to attempt to turn out of the way realizing that he not playing and that they going walk, they walking right into destruction you know and these are the priests see, because Balaam you know speaks to the false messiah it's not like he coming with his own priesthood no he's he's using the ones that's already in existence you know the only thing is some of them, some of them, many of them going to follow him and some of them not and some of them are going to follow him, but then as they begin to follow him, thinking that he has all the answers, then they're going to wake up and they're going to, they're going to see. Right. They're going to see, they're going to say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, what is that up in the road? I can see we heading for destruction. I can see that. I can see the angel of Yah. See, because these two, man, these witnesses are not going to be playing with them. They're going to see them in the way. They're going to see them at, when this stuff begin to unfold. They're going to see these two witnesses coming up against them. And they're going to know that they're of Elohim. They're going to, they're going to see that, hey, well, man, we, we heading for destruction. Because they're going to know the word. They're going to know the word. They're going to know who the two witnesses are. Eventually, they're going to catch on to two, who the two witnesses are. See, but it's real hard. It's going to be, it's going to be hard to tell, see, because you have, you have two of the enemy, too. So you got the two witnesses on one side, but then you got... 
you got Balaam and Balak or Apollyon and the false prophet on the other side. So you got two and two. Yeah. And Apollyon, he was doing he was doing great works before the false prophet stepped on the scene. You see? And then the false prophet come and raise him back up and you know now they together forever. You know, tougher than leather and all that. But here it is, the two witnesses, they coming up against them. So it's like, oh, man, which side do I choose? That fork in the road. That's that fork in the road. You know, now some of the ones who are going to choose, Balaam and Apollyon, they're going to get along in the way, and they're going to realize, oops, I made the wrong choice. I can see destruction up ahead. And they're going to try to turn aside out of the way, out of that broad way that leads up unto destruction. They're trying to get out of that. And they're trying to get back in, they trying to even go back into the field. The field speaks to the world. We, we see, in, uh, we learned that in Matt, Matthew Yahoo 7, 13. It says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for why, oh, that's the wrong verse, isn't it? What? Matthew Yahoo 13, 38. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. You know, so here it is. They're trying to turn out of Balaam's way and get back into the world. You know, Matthew Yahoo 7.13 speaks to Balaam's way. It says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. They're going to realize that they're on that broad way to destruction. And many be which go in there at. They're going to see everyone and they're going to say, whoa, wait a minute, hold up. I think we've been fooled. And they're going to try to go back into the world, try to take refuge in the world. But well, Balaam's not going to be happy. It says, he smoked the donkey and turned to turn her into the way. So now he's going to make her go that way. First you had a choice. But now that you've chosen, You've already used up your choice. Now you don't have no choice no more. Because we already read in, in Revelation 13, those who, those who um, don't take the mark, they, they kill him. You know, so you get a chance to choose, but then after that, you know, your choice is over. You don't chose. And you're going to stick with it whether you want, want to stick with your choice or not. Ain't no... Blackjack no trade back. We're not going back. So we see here Balaam smoking and turning, turning her um, to turn her back into the way. Because he need them. You know, because they're setting an example for everybody else to see. You know, so as long as they see the priesthood following nice, nicely behind them, you know, everybody else following. Can't have the priesthood the very ones that's supposed to be right up under you start rebelling. Yeah. <laughs> you know, then everybody's going to start getting uh, getting, getting unsure of themselves. You know, so he's going to be, be rebuking them. They're going to try to get back into the world. He's not, he not having it. So this is a picture of the priest trying to take refuge back in the world. But he's not, he not going to let them do it. He's going to persecute them in order to keep them traveling in the way he wanted them to go, whether it leads to destruction or not. You know, they see destruction down the line, and he telling them, you know, of course, going to be telling them, no, nah, you know, we got this. Wow. Revelations, chapter 11, speaks to the, those two servants that's coming, the two witnesses. Let me have my next reader read Revelation 11, 3 through 8. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, and the two candlesticks standing before the Elohim of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them into to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war 
against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Adonai was crucified. Okay. Now here it is. Yah gives power to his two witnesses to come and get us. They come and loose us. And they, they, have their, they have their prophecy that they come with. They have their word of Elohim. You know, this is what's likely going to kill the first beast. You know, give them a deadly wound. <coughs> now it says that these are the two olive trees. You know, which the olive trees speaks of the house of Israel. You know, and we know Israel was divided into two camps. You know, Israel and Judah. And it speaks of them being the two candlesticks standing before the Elohim of the earth. And we know the candlestick speaks to the ecclesias, the church. You know, so here it is. We see these two churches made up of all the children of Israel and Judah here in the, in the last times. Hence, each one had their own witness. One to the Yahudim, one to the house of Israel. And they're olive trees, of course, they're candlesticks. They have light. You know, so they're coming with light. That is, perception and understanding concerning Yah's word in which they're going to be teaching unto the saints. That they will be able to understand the scriptures and know what's, what's transpiring. Now, the thing is, is you have this false light coming from the false messiah and Apollyon on the other end claiming that they have the true light, you know, and spilling out their lies. And you're going to have to choose. That's that fork in the road. Now, they end up getting killed, but they not no punks. We see in verse 5, it says, If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devour of their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must, in this manner, be killed. So, they're speaking that word of Elohim with authority. And Yah is backing them up. The Yah is that consuming fire. And they have power to shut the heavens. That it rain not in the days of their prophecy. They have power over the waters, turn them to blood, and to smite the earth of all plagues as often as they will. What does that sound like? Don't that sound like Moshe when he went into Mitzrayim, when he went into Egypt to, to let my people go? Mm -hmm. They coming to get us. Yes. They coming Probably to loose the priesthood, mm -hmm. the ass in the coat. Mm -hmm. They're coming to loose them, to bring them back to Messiah. Mm -hmm. But even though they're brought and paid for, the enemy don't want to let them go. So you got a similar situation as to when Moshe went into the world, or went into Egypt, and likewise told Pharaoh, hey, y'all told me to come get his people. And it was two of them. Him and Aaron. Amen? Same, same. You know, and it wasn't until, you know, ten plagues later, that started out the same way, started out the very same way, turning the water into blood, and then smiting them with plagues. And then when they were finished, then Moshe and Aaron brought them on out. You know, but here it is. They're gonna, uh, they're gonna kill them, and they're gonna leave them laying in the street. And because they're going to know the prophecy, they're going to know the word. See, this is, this is, this is a sword fight, y'all. Mm -hmm. This is a sword fight, so you better have your sword sharp. Mm -hmm. You know, because they're they going to know the word, and because of what they were prophesying, mm -hmm. the word that's given unto them, they're they not going to they do like they did the Messiah and put them in the mouth of the cave and, and put a great stone over it. Mm-mm. 
We're going to be right, lay, lay right in the middle of the street. We all going to see what happened this time. <laughs> it ain't going to be no if, ands, or buts. Everybody going to know what happened. Because we, we got the camera on you, and it's watching you for 72 hours. So we gonna see, we gonna see what you gonna do. If you gonna get up, we gonna see. <laughs> but sure enough, they gonna get up. <laughs> they gonna get up, and many of us gonna get up with them. You know, <clears throat> this is this is what. This is going to be an awesome time. I mean, it's going to be an awesome, a tremendously scary time for, for us. But, you know, I mean, just it's going to be an awesome time all, all, all the same. Just, just, just reading about his plan, it's just so awesome, you know. And it's, it's not like it's something that he hasn't told us, he hasn't prepared us for. We can know what's going to happen. It already done happened time, time and time again, actually. You know, he, he shows us examples so that we can know, so we're not caught off guard. We're to have that light. And that's, that's what these two candlesticks are going to be coming doing. They're just going to be shedding light on these things. Even as Messiah began to take them and show them him, himself and how he had to die in, in the scriptures and how the scriptures portrayed it and, and, and dictated that he had to go through that. It's going to be the same, same thing. Second Peter... You know, because cause we, we spoke to, we, we spoke to how, you know, uh, how the saints going to be, you know, and how, how we'll be able to tell them, you know, we know they're going to be covered. Uh, maybe I didn't speak on that. But they're going to be covered with um, the covering upon them and up underneath them, yep. before them, and behind them. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't touch on that, did I? Uh, okay, we, we see when they spread their garments, they put garments on him, they put Yahshua on him, then they spread garments in the way, and they had cut the branches that speaks to life, so they're walking in the way of life, and they, and they straw them in the way, so uh, when, when, you, uh, when you look at, look at the other account in Matthew, it speaks of them being before them and behind them. So as they're walking and they have all these garments in the way, you, you look before them, all you see are these garments. You look behind them, all you see is these garments on, on, the, on the ground. So they're on the ground before them, they're on the ground be, behind them. And all these garments just speaks to the coverings of all the saints that preceded them. That's all, that's all it is. It's just, it's just because, you know, all these witnesses... That's shown the way over the years that we have entailed within our scriptures. They show the way before us prophetically. They show the way behind us historically. And the Ruach HaKodesh that covered them covers us. And by keeping our feet Walking in that way that they've shown, that's what keeps us safe. That's how we can know for a surety that we're on the path that leadeth unto life. Because it's not a new path. It's a very ancient path. And that's how we can know that we're on the right path and we didn't choose the wrong way when we were at that fork in the road. These two witnesses are going to be showing that, hey, this is what they did. This is what you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is what this is telling you. It was it's prophesying to you what you were to do. What they did is already, it's already written. The path is already set. We don't have to guess at it. We have it right in our word. Yeah. That's those garments that's, that's strolled all before us with the branches, the life that's in them. We don't have to guess. We can know for a surety. And that's what these witnesses are going to be doing. They're going to be here to witness, to bear witness to the way that lead them to life. 
they're going to be the ones that saying they, they're going to be at that fork of the road at that fork in the road saying this way, this is the way right here. You know, and they're going to be able to show us in the word, you know, how for a surety we can know. See, Abraham walked this way. Isaac walked this way. Yeah. Yaakov walked yeah, this way. Yeah, yeah. Yeshua walked this way. Yeah. The apostles walked this way. Yeah. You know, the prophets walked this way. And now you got to walk this way. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to be showing us this. You know. That's why it's, they're, they're making the path before us, behind us, with cover from above and beneath. We are completely sealed with Yahshua upon us. As long as we keep him upon us, as long as we bear his burden, we're safe. We're safe. That's how we're going to know for a surety. It's not... He's going to take the guesswork out of it. And to bear witness to what they're saying, they're going to be, they're going to be doing those, those, uh, those uh, signs and wonders of their own, the two witnesses. Mm -hmm. You know, bringing those plagues upon the earth because of the wickedness that's upon the earth. Man, how could I miss that part? But here it is. Oh, we just read that, right? Okay, so how are we going to be able to tell... That's how we're going to be able to know the righteous. Because the righteous is going to do everything that the righteous had al already done. The way of the righteous, it don't change. It don't look no different. What was righteous 2,000 years ago is still righteous today. Right don't change. See, now there's going to be some ways that we can know the false prophets, too. And know that know where, where they're coming from. And 2 Peter speaks to this. You know, he, he, he spoke to us so well, I had, to, I had to get the whole word, his whole word in here. You know, so let me have my first reader read uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. But there are false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Adonai that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their perniciousness, pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with fine feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if Elohim spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after shall live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Okay, now, we're going to, see, that's the thing, you know, just, just like Noah preached righteousness, we're going to be, we preach righteousness, and they're going to be preaching righteousness, you know, what, like I say, what was right 2,000 years ago is still right today, you know, and, and it's, you know, I don't think it's no coincidence that he, he, he bring up Sodom and Gomorrah, especially in, in conjunction to what we see prevailing over our land today. You know, it's making us look like a modern side of the more. You know, and he's not playing with that. In fact, Apollyon has said of him that he won't even he won't even um, take a woman. So he may he may likely be a homosexual. You know, so I just figured I'd throw that out there. But. 
but this thing is this thing is serious because you know this is what we're gonna have to look for. It says there were false prophets also among people, even as there should be false teachers among you. So this is how they're gonna come in. They're gonna come in teaching this falsehood, and it says who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. You know they're gonna sneak them in. Some even denying Adonai that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And, and unfortunately, I have to say, I've even seen this happen mm -hmm. in the faith. I've seen people, you know, come out of the proverbial frying pan of Christianity and jump into the skillet of Judaism, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and just totally deny Messiah altogether mm -hmm. who led them onto the path to begin with, mm -hmm. you know, but he didn't lead them to go that way, <laughs> let them go the other way. You know, but they have a goal. Through their covetousness, shall um, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you? They just trying they trying to make profit of you. They trying to they trying to um, build up their wealth off of you. They trying to sell you. You know, they just want they just want to gain off of you. We see some of that going on today, don't we? But they're not getting away with nothing. Mm. They're not getting away with anything. This is this is what it goes on to say. We have our next reader read 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. For that righteous man <coughs> dwelling among them is in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from the day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Adonai knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they. Self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of uh, dig dignities. dignities. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not ra railing accusation against them before the Adonai, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they have understood not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as that, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the day, the daytime. Spots, spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and at and heart they have had exercise with covetous practices first children. Yes. Now, first of all, it's going to be a whole lot of temptation going on. <laughs> Let's, make, let's put that on the table first and foremost. Mm. Going to be a whole lot of temptation going on. But as we see in verse nine, verse 9, the Adonai know of how to deliver yeah. those that follow him out of temptations. Thank you. you know, <laughs> and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. You know, all you have to do is give yourself to him. He knows how to deliver you out of those temptations. But then... That walk after the lust of the flesh. You know, those are the ones that you have to look out for. They're like natural brute beasts. You know, beasts, they just do whatever they want to do when they want to do it. You know, and it speaks of them, uh, uh, they, had, they counted pleasure to riot in the daytime. You know, and... and that's that's speaking of not so much as uh not so much as fighting and and, and cussing and, and going against different races, but it, it speaks of 
that's the type of rioting that speaks of doing things in excess. So it's, it's, it's real likely that he's speaking of being drunk, drunken, even during the day. You know, usually people party at night. Well, you know, we're going to get it started early. You know, they're going to they be like the porch monkeys. You know, first thing in the morning, you know, going to get, get a bottle, you know. Yeah, so, you know, that's... That's not, you know, that's one of the things that we'll be able to look out for. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be drug, drug addicts and use all, anything that you can abuse, they're going to abuse it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's, that's caters to the flesh. And it's going to, they're going to be spots and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings mm -hmm. while they feast with you. So while, while, while they're eating with us, all you have to do is watch them. You should know them by their fruit. Look for the fruit, and you'll be able to tell. You know, if you don't see the love, joy, peace, long something. If you see yeah, yeah. hatred and frustration and, yeah. and, and, and backbiting and, yeah. you know, and lasciviousness and things that, such as this, such as the lust of the flesh, then we know. Yeah. You should know them by their fruit. Hence, having eyes full of adultery yeah. and that cannot cease from sin. And the, and the sad part is they're beguiling unstable souls. Mm. You know, and that, that's the thing, because, you know, those unstable sto souls, they look and they say, well, you know, maybe, you know, this is the way, way it is, you know. Right. And, you know, they, you know, everybody can't be wrong. Mm. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's the broad way. They got, they, they got the numbers on their side. Moral majority, you know. Right. You know. <laughs> hey. They got the numbers on their side. Yeah. Uh, next reader, 2 Peter 2, 15 through 22. Which have forsaken the way and are going astray, following the way of Balaam, Balaam the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking <laughs> with, the, with <laughs> man's voice, <laughs> for bad, the madness of the prophets. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they all allure, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from the who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For of woman, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Adonai, the Savior, Yahushua, Messiah, they are again entangled therein, and overcome the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the soul that was soul that was washed to her wallowing in the in the mire. Yes, yes. So you know, all we have to do is pay attention, y'all. That's that. That's it. You know, now these ones that's going to be following the way of Balaam, as as we're uh, that's that's going to be following him in, in in his way. They love the wages of unrighteousness. You know, they know what's right, but they just can't resist the, the unrighteous rate on um, wages. You know, they like satisfying their flesh more so. You know, and in order to satisfy their flesh, a lot of times it takes money. You know, and, and that's the thing. They're going to be, you know, they're going to be bribed, many of them. They're going to be bribed into into following them, you know, and then after the, 
after they done seen that the money isn't all it's cracked up to be and, you know, find themselves strung out and, you know, and everything. And, you know, it's kind of, yeah. I mean, you see it every day in the entertainment industry yeah. with the actors and the singers and the athletes, you know, they sell their souls for yeah. for for the wealth and then they, they get the, the what they call the good life, quote unquote, <laughs> you know, and they realize that it isn't all that it was it was made out to be. And you know, and they finally get a get a whiff of fresh air, you know, for a few minutes while they're not high, mm -hmm. and come to the realization that you know, man, this is not this is not what I wanted. This is not what I thought it would be. But it's too late. Mm -hmm. It's too late. You cross addicted, oftentimes at this point, mm -hmm. you know, just trying to look for a way out, and yeah. and you know, it's 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 rough. Once, once you get in that deep, it's real rough, you know, because now in order to leave, you got to leave everything, you know, and you don't, you don't got used to the status and you don't got used to, to, to the, uh, the money and, and uh, the way of life. It become real rough, you know, kind of become like quicksand, you know, you, you, easy to get in, but hard to get out of, you know, and you start seeing those who, who you thought was leading you the right way, you know, you start seeing their hypocrisy. You start seeing that they were really just wells without water. <laughs> that, that they was clouds that are carried with, with a tempest to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. You know, they, they, you start, start seeing, hey, hey, wait a minute, ain't no, supposed to be a well of life, but there ain't no water in there. You know, I need some water. You know, I need some counsel, I need some help, but it's not none there. You know, they speak, they, all they speak in is great swelling words of vanity. You know, hey, get this nose job, get this breast job, get this booty job, you know. I mean, whatever else they doing these days, you know. And it's just, it's just, you know. They allure through the lust of the flesh. That's how they. That's how they. they draw you through much wantonness, lasciviousness. And they tell you, yet yeah, all you got, you got to do is do this one, and it's gonna set you free. You're gonna be. You're gonna be free. You're gonna be right then. You know. But I love verse 19. For of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought into bondage. Whatever vice you let overcome you, that's what vice you are in bondage to. So if Satan has overcome you in an area of your life, then you are in bondage to the enemy in that area of your life. You know, when I was addicted to gambling, a gambleholic, Hi. <laughs> My name is Ronnie and I'm a gambleholic. <laughs> I was in bondage to that spirit of gambling. You know, and I, I could, and the sad part about it is I couldn't even see it. I didn't even realize it. I didn't even realize that the enemy had me in bondage. I thought, you know, I thought that 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 uh, it was other Messiah that it, it, that he could use that, you know. Cause I thought if I won, I thought you know, hey, that was a blessing. You know, I remember one time I went, I won twenty thousand. You couldn't tell me that wasn't no blessing. I went in there with five hundred and came out with like twenty two thousand. Really? That was a blessing to me. I felt blessed. <laughs> Sent some money home to my mama, blessed her. Hello. You know, I was passing blessings out, you know. I thought, I, I thought it was a blessing. I didn't know. I didn't know. I was hooked. Hoodwink, bamboo, better spray. You know. Yeah. I'm telling you. Balaam is smooth. <laughs> Balaam is real smooth. You know, it's kind of be kind of hard to tell somebody that there wasn't no blessing. You know, 
I was sure it was, <laughs> you know, but it wasn't. I was really in bondage. And I found out after the, after the money was spent. <laughs> you know, one thing about it though, mama ain't raised no fool. I ain't lose it back. <laughs> I spent that. <laughs> now, I probably lost a lot more later, but that particular, that I, I spent that. You know, yeah, but that's how he sucked us in though. We look up and we think, you know, this not that bad and, you know, and it's okay and, you know, y'all knows my heart and all this stuff, that all these excuses that we make up. But the reality of the matter is we're in bondage. For of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage. We're in bondage to the enemy and Yah has came to really set the captives free. Not to just promise them liberty, you know, but themselves are servants of corruption. You know, and that's that's how that's how you'll be able to know them. They'll be hypocrites. Yeah. You know, they'll be saying, you know, hey, you know, let me get this, uh, let me get this thorn out your out your eye, you know, and they got a beam in their own. Yeah. You know, <laughs> if they want to get the splinter out of your eye, and they got a beam in their own. Really? You know, that's what we're gonna be seeing, y'all. I'm telling you, that's what we see now today. You know, all, you, all we got to do is look. Numbers 22, 24, but the angel of Yahuwah stood in the path of the vineyards and a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. The vineyard speaks to Israel and Yahudah. And the wall speaks to protection. I should say that the vineyard speaks to Israel and Yahudah in Yahushua, in Messiah. And the wall speaks to, speak of protection. You put a wall around things or a hedge around things you want to protect. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes vineyards had a wall or a fence or a hedge about the vineyard to protect it. Mm -hmm. So in other words, this is a picture of the angel or messengers of Yah protecting the way of the vineyard. That is the way of <laughs> Yahushua. We read in Yochanan 15, 1 through 5 that Yahushua says, I am the true vine and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you, abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. You know, so this vineyard, this path of vineyards, is actually the way of Yahushua. That's his way. He was that vine. And he laid that vine, and all we got to do is follow it and attach ourselves to it, just like branches. <laughs> and we'll get, we'll get to uh, where we need to be, even eternal life. Now, also, let us consider that Yahushua, in this account, concerning when he sent his servants over to, uh, to, to, to get the donkey and the coat, he started out in Bethage, which means the house of figs. Then he went to the Mount of Olives, which speaks of the Olives. And he wound up in Bethany, which means the house of dates. If we consider where he was traveling, it's apparent that Yahushua, too, was traveling within the path of the vineyards. He was also traveling in the path of the vineyards, even as we read in Numbers 22, Balaam um, traveling in the path of the vineyards. And the angel of Yahuwah is in that path of the vineyards because he's there to protect us. You know, and 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 they 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 do they do an awesome job. They they do the best they can. You know. Uh, also consider Isaiah five seven. It says, "For the vineyard of Yahuwah, <coughs> Sabaoth of hosts, is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant." 
and he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, and for righteousness, but behold, a cry. You know, so that also lets us know who the vineyard is. Numbers 25 and 22, 25, and 26, and when the donkey saw the angel of Yahuwah, she thrust herself onto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. <laughs> and the angel of Yahuwah went further and stood in a narrow place <laughs> where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. <laughs> okay, so now we see the priesthood. Now that some of them have tried to... Uh, go back into the world, and they got rebuked, you know, or killed or whatever. Now we see, get along a little further, and we got some more. They trying to fight back now. You know, which is, you know, this, 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 you know, they, they like, okay, well, we see you're not going to let us go. We might, might as well start training and put our dukes up, you know. And uh, says, you know, she thrust herself onto the wall. You know, the wall had a wall on the left. And the wall on the right, right? The wall speaks of protection. And those two witnesses was our protection. So they're running them into them. You know? Here it is. They're working. We got like devil agents up in there. You know, they, they're sending them. They're, they're running them into, into the, uh, the two witnesses sent from Yah. You know? Since they won't let them out, then they're working, working against them from the inside. And push his foot up, crush his foot up against Against the, uh, against the wall. Mm. Yeah, he smote her again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he tapped that behind again. Mm. You know, and then the angel of Yahuwah went further mm. and stood in a narrow place. Mm. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. Where was no way to turn to the right or to the left. Somebody got to die now. Yeah. Ain't, no, ain't, no way, ain't no way around this one, mm. you know. We read about this in Daniel chapter 11, picking it up from verse 31, going to verse 35. It says, and the arms shall stand, and arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make of desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. This is how he's going to get them, through flatteries and through bribery. But the people that do know their Elohim shall do strong, shall be strong and do exploits. Those of us that know we're gonna be out there and we're gonna, we're gonna be, y'all gonna be using us. We're gonna be strong. We're gonna do exploits. Yeah, even us that understand among the people, we shall instruct many. Yet we shall fall by the sword and by flame by captivity, and by spoil many days. Verse 34, Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. So we got a little help. You know, our witnesses, they're going to come and they're going to give us a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. They're going to be trying to bribe us, y'all. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and purge and make them right even to the time of the end. See, remember what y'all said, even his very elect will fall short if it was possible. Some of those who have understanding, they, the bribes going they're not going to bribe you with something that you don't like. They're going to they gonna be presenting stuff that you like. You like women, they're going to give you, hey, the best money can buy. <laughs> you know? You know, if it's something else, they're going to they gonna offer you the best stuff. Yeah. It's not really a temptation. It's not, not something you like. Right. <laughs> you know, so, you know, that's why I try to make the only thing I like is yeah. <laughs> well, you want to tempt me, send yeah my way. <laughs> How about that? Numbers 2.27, and when the donkey saw the angel of Yahuwah, she <laughs> fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote <laughs> The donkey with a staff. Now he's beating him with the staff. You know, now I like this though, because here it is. We have some of these priests that are working on the inside out. They're trying to they're trying to run them into, into the priest so that the priest can, can get at them. 
you know, I mean, the two witnesses can get at them. They're trying to run them into the way of the, uh, the two witnesses that's, that's uh, destroying everything with the fire that's coming from their mouth, you know. But now, here it is. They get to that place where it can't turn to the left or to the right. It's so narrow up in there. What they do? They fall down. This is a picture of worship. They begin to worship Yah, even in the midst of the camp of Balaam. Even up under his authority, they begin worshiping Yah. You know, now, this gives rise, this really ticks Balaam off. And this gives rise to discipline from his staff. He start he, he take his staff and he start beating. What does the staff? What does the staff symbolize? The staff symbolized the food supply, his strength, and his authority. In Isaiah 14, 4, 5 and 6, Isaiah 14, verses 5 and 6, it says, Yahuwah have broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted and unhindered. So we we see here the staff typifies that of the wicked, his anger, and him going upside the head, upside the head with his authority. Also, Psalms 10, 110, verse 2, Yahuwah shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. So it speaks of also one's strength in Leviticus 26, 26. And when I have broken the staff of your bread. And it speaks to, you know, the food supply, your know, bread, your teachings and instructions, you know, and this is how he's going to be trying to beat them back in line. You know, he can cut off their food supply quite literally, but he also can keep on feeding them with that bull crap, you know, that, that, that uh, those teachings and instructions of darkness, of confusion. And trying to get them all confused. You know, have them thinking, you know, up is down and right is left. Numbers 22, 28 through 33. Uh, my next reader, please. And Yahuwah opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said, said to, unto Balaam, What have I done unto, unto thee? And thou hast smitten me with, three, with these three times. And Balaam said unto the donkey, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there, I would there were a worse sword in mine hand. For now would I kill thee. And the donkey said unto Balaam, I am not thine donkey, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day. Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then Yahuwah opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of Yahuwah standing in the way. And his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head, and fell flat on his face. And the angel of Yahuwah said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine donkey these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because the way is reserved before me. And the donkey saw me, and turned from me, from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now... Also, I had slain thee and saved her life. <coughs> okay, now this is the thing that get y'all peed off every time. When you have those who seeking to serve him, and you won't let them. This is what we see here with Balaam. We see some of his priests seeing the destruction up ahead and choosing to try to leave from it, but he won't let him. We see him even fighting back, but he still won't let him. Then we see him bowing down and worshiping Yah. And that's when Yah say enough is enough. When they come back to him, then that's when it stops. And the same thing for us. You know, a lot of us may be going through things in our life, turmoil, and, you know, and what have you. Bow down and worship Yah the Most High. 
he'll put a stop to all the enemy's madness in your life. Just give yourself to him. We see in, in verse 30, the priesthood, that is the donkey, speaking to Balaam, Am I not thine upon which thou hast written since I was dying unto this day? You know, yeah, the money and everything was good and I was loyal to you. Until I seen death in the way. You know, once I seen that this thing was for real, that this was really the way to lead us unto death, and I could see death up ahead, and you still talking about, come on, <laughs> trust in me. No, I see death up ahead. You know, and then Yah finally opened Balaam's eyes, and it's too late. This is really the part of the story where he gets thrown into the lake of fire along with, with a pile Yah. You know, he falls flat on his face. And, you know, he really don't get back up. You know, so here it is. We see in verse 33 that he says that uh, the, the uh, messenger of Yah, he, he said, the priests, they saw me and tried to turn from me these, these three times. Unless they had turned, if it wasn't for them, I'd have been killed you. Surely now I had slain thee and saved her alive. And that's exactly what he's going to do in the end. Those priests who did finally worship him, worship Yah, they'll be saved. And, the other, and of course, those who didn't, and along with the false prophet and Apollyon, will be thrown into the lake of fire. And Mark 11, 11 through 18, and Yahushua entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked around about upon all things, and now the evening tide was come, and he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. And on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree, a far off having leaves, he came and happily that he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of the figs was not yet. And Yahushua answered and said unto, unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. Mm -hmm. And his disciples heard it. Mm -hmm. And they come to Jerusalem, and Yahushua went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and, and brought the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple and he taught them saying unto them it is not written is it not written my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer but ye have made it a den of thieves and the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And this is going to be the whole problem during this time, because those of us who know the word and have the understanding, we're going to be going up to the temple and saying, this is not supposed to be like this. It says right here in this word that it's not supposed to be like this, and why are you doing that, and why are you doing this other thing, and no, ain't none of this stuff, right? And when they begin, when they, when we become, come in there and we start talking that talk, you know, the scribes and the chief priests during that time, they're gonna seek, they're gonna seek the, how they might destroy us. And we're gonna be going in there and we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be strong and we're gonna be doing exploits, but yet they're gonna overcome us. And they're gonna eventually kill us. And then we're gonna get help with a little help from our from the two witnesses. But it's just gonna be a little help because they're gonna get killed too. <laughs> And they're gonna leave leave their body strong in, in the middle of the um in the middle of the uh, uh of the field so everybody can see. But we know in the end we win. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, we're gonna get wore out for a minute. You know, even as Messiah was wore out for a minute. You know, but because we're gonna be walking in truth and because we're gonna be of the truth. We're going to resurrect light unto the truth. Because you can't kill truth. All you can do is beat it up and knock it down. But it will always resurrect itself. 
Numbers 23, 5 through 10, teaches us that Yahuwah put a word in Balaam's mouth. <laughs> and it said, Return unto Balaam, and thus thou shalt speak. And he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab, and he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the king of Moab, have brought me from Amram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come curse me, Yaakov, and, and come defy Israel. How shall I curse whom Elohim have not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom Yahuwah have not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. You know, and this prophecy was, turned out to be a blessing upon Israel, and it still remains true today. Those of us who are Israel, who are Yisrael, who are men, who wrestle with Elohim and with evil and with Elohim and prevail by holding on to Elohim, we are to dwell alone. We are to dwell, dwell alone and we shall not, we are not to be reckoned among the nations. That is, we're to be in the world but not of the world. Who can count the dust of Yaakov and the number of the fourth of Israel? Can't even count the fourth of us. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. There is a death of the righteous. And that's what this time we've been going over all this time. That's what it speaks of. It speaks of the death of the righteous. Standing for truth and dying for Yahushua's namesake. You know, this is the way we want to die. We all have to die. I mean, you know, everybody make it out of a sad thing, and it is, you know, in, in a manner of speaking, but it's even sadder when you know that the person that died don't know Yah, didn't know Yah. But if they knew Yah, it's not, you know, it's not really all that sad, because we know they're going to they gonna be, we're going to see them again. You know, they're going to have a smile on their face. You know, Let my last end be like his, like the, like the righteous man. Mm -hmm. And we also see in Mark 12, Yahshua, he began right after. Is it, I just figured that out, you know, figured out to show that because it was just hmm. uncanny that right afterwards, both of them began to speak in parables. Hmm. You know, and both of the parables kind of coincide. In Mark 12, 1 through 11, it's, uh, Yahushua said, uh, says, it, he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it and digged a place for the wine fat and built a tower and led it out to the husbandmen and went into a far country. And at the season, he sent to the husbandmen a servant that he might receive from the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. And they caught him and beat him and sent him away. And again, he sent unto them another servant. And at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. And again, sent another and they killed him and many others, beating some and killing some. This is exactly what's been transpiring all along. This is exactly what we've been talking about and how it's going to end, you know, with the false prophet and Apollyon. And this is the death of the righteous. Verse 6, having yet therefore... One son, his well-beloved, he sent him also. Last unto them, saying, they were, they were reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and an inheritance shall be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall, therefore, the Adonai of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen and will give the vineyard unto others. And have ye not read the scripture, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? This was the Adonai's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. And also, that's what we're seeking to do, to be even as these faithful servants mm -hmm. who came and laid down their lives, you know, to serve Yah. Now the death of the righteous. That's all I have for you. Prayer is a blessing. Mm -hmm.